returning to the topic at hand. No. On, <laughs> no, on a more on a more serious note, no, we're talking about the, we're talking about the player's avatar in the game world. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're talking about that. Yeah. Physically ill. This week on Backward Compatible, what is an avatar? How is it different from any other player character? Plus, the crew talks about their overstuffed Steam libraries and which games they've spent way too much time with. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. So, uh, Backward Compatible listeners, we're back um, for another podcast. This is episode three. Um, I'm Jim. I'm Richard. And I'm Chris. I was trying to think of some snarky line to say after this is episode three, like some sort of Star Wars reference or... <laughs> revenge of the podcast? Yeah, re- like Revenge of the Backward... No, it's fucking yeah. terrible. Yeah. Well, you see, the problem is we're not doing the, um, the sequels first, so we, <laughs> it doesn't really make quite so, as much sense to do so, that all. So this is episode six, right? I guess we've done four, five, and six. Yeah, we did we've, have an episode zero. We, we haven't released. That's yet. that's the unreleased prequel <laughs> idea. That's the Star Wars Christmas special. <laughs> <They're>, uh, <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that description. Okay, well, I believe uh, Chris has a a short uh, icebreaker game for us that we can kind of discuss for a bit. Yeah, not so, not so much a game, more of just kind of like a fun little discussion. Uh, Richard actually gave me this idea. Um, so it's not about Sonic. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. so prepared. See episode two for context. Sonic trivia. <laughs> um, but no, the uh, the idea here is uh, we've all bought too many games. Um, you might get that reference on Steam, and uh, we've just got these libraries full of you know six hundred plus games. I don't even know how many at this point. Um, just like all grayed out, not installed on your computer, but just waiting there for you to use them whenever you do. And so we wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what are some of the games that like, why is this on my library? How did I get here? Um, what have I spent way too much time on? What do I own that I haven't played yet? Et cetera, et cetera. So anyone have anything they want to jump in with there? Well, one of the ones that I realized a couple of days ago, that's shocking to me is, I mean, I've, I think I've mentioned the walking dead in both of our first po- couple podcasts i think so, so yeah i don't know regardless for context i'm a huge walking dead game fan i'm a telltale fan and the wolf among us finale just released the other day and i realized i hadn't even played the first episode yet i bought it <laughs> and it's all installed and updated on my computer nice. and i still haven't even played the first episode and i like i've flown to another country to talk about the walking dead yeah and i've still never played this game <laughs> Like what? How does that even happen? I've played so much Hearthstone and so much. I mean, we played Wolfenstein, you know, but I haven't set aside time to even start The Wolf Among Us. All that Hearthstone you've been playing. Yeah, it's an addiction. <laughs> it's taking time away from other gaming activities. Yeah. <laughs> the itch. You want to play right now too, don't you? <laughs> well. <laughs> okay, podcast is over for today. We're just gonna go play. Uh, maybe we can make that our next um, roundtable, possibly. Yeah, because uh, I have that too, and you get to play it. So. Man, The Wolf Among Us, though, is like... <laughs> it looks so good! <laughs> I'd like to play it as well. And I was a yeah. huge fan of Fables. Did you guys ever read Fables? Um, no. Actually, I surprisingly haven't. I've read a lot of comic books. I'm a pretty big comic person. That's one of the, the few series that I hear recommended a lot that I've never yeah, really it's checked fantastic, out. Yeah, it's fantastic, man. Like, that's what... When they announced their newest series after The Walking Dead, I was like squeeing with excitement and I still haven't even booted the damn thing up. <laughs> Believe me, you don't want to hear Richard squee. It's not it's not pleasant. <laughs> it's not not really. Well, Alright, thanks Chris. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, so that's mine that just like how the hell have I not played this yet? You know, I've got quite a few, like I think the majority of my Steam list is grey thanks to the Humble Bundle. But yeah. Uh, yeah. I just this this that one is I don't understand how I haven't played it yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, speaking of the Humble Bundle, if you guys happen to have not heard of it or sort of heard about it to know what it is, um, really cool deal they have going on where they um, uh, sell groups of games for charity. Um, One might call them bundles. They, you can call them bundles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to uh, define a word with the same word. Um, but yeah, Jim. <laughs> they have. Um, they started off doing just like, you know, one at a time for a few weeks, and it's pretty much a pay-what-you-want model. Sometimes they'll give you thresholds, like pay more than the average to unlock a game or pay at least this much to unlock a game. Um, 
but now they have like you know weekly bundles and they have like you know book bundles and all sorts of crazy stuff like that the uh, the weekly book bundle is actually pretty cool oh, i yeah? enjoyed that i got will wheaton's book off of that one week and it will was wheaton? Mm-hmm. Will wheaton? Will wheaton? Will wheaton? Will wheaton? wheaton yeah it's surprisingly good <laughs> cool um, but yeah, so the the only problem with Humble Bundles is as awesome as they are, a lot of times you'll buy a whole bundle to get the one or two games you're kind of interested in. And so, you know, you... Every week. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically like, think of it as a sale for the one game you want, and then just like filler for your Steam library. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, it's buy Civilization Five for $5 and get all this other stuff that you can install or give yeah. away on Facebook. That's, yeah. that's what I ended up doing. I have the Civ Five bundle, because um, I wanted to play Civ Five and I did, enjoyed it. Uh, but I got all these other Civ. I got Civ 3, Civ 4, all these expansions for them. I got something called Sid Meier's Ace Patrol. What? And, uh, yeah, there, I got that one, too. Is that like a World War One or World War Two game? I don't even know. I would assume. Mm-hmm. Probably plays Danger Zone as soon as you boot it up. No, that's Top Gun. Yeah, I don't... That would actually be pretty cool. I'd boot it up. <laughs> yeah. I'd have it on Kenny the Loggins is always worth it, man. Yeah, totally, totally. Uh, but, yeah, so that was... Yeah, I played Civ Five and I put a lot of hours into Civ Five, but that's really oh, the one I played. Oh, yeah. Oh man, I really enjoyed it. I it's like I was telling you before we we started uh, started the podcast up. It's like the one of the few games that I'll start playing and I'll completely lose track of time. Oh, you get, that, you get that like oh, I just wanted to go one more turn, and so I think ah, I got like thirty minutes to play. I'll sit here and play, and usually I'm pretty good keeping track of time, but on this game I will lose track entirely. I'll look over at my clock, which is usually behind my computer desk. And it'll be an hour and a half later. And I'll think well, see, isn't the whole point of the Civ games that you can make your move and then come back to that same game however longer, you know, or however much later you want to? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's all turn-based. It's turn-based, so of course you can save it and then quit and come back. Right. So that's what I was doing. I was playing, I'm like, I got 30 minutes to play. I'll play for 30 minutes, then I'll save it and then do something else, you know get back to work or whatever I, I also had to do. And if you actually try to play Civ in one sitting, it's a very long game. Yeah, see, that's you what can't. I... I've, yeah. <laughs> I've had some friends that have, you know, I've gone over to their dorms at college and been like, you know, oh, hey, you playing Civ Five? Like, yeah. The, uh, wait, is that the same game from, like, a month ago? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it can yeah. be. They can get really long. Plus, the thing that I don't like about Civ Five, and it always kind of annoyed me, is that whenever... If, if any of the, the surrounding civilizations start to do anything aggressive to you at all, I have a tendency to overreact to it and just destroy their civilization. But whenever you do that, everyone else now hates you around the world, yeah. even though you're not the aggressor. <laughs> so it'd be, it'd be the equivalent of... Um, Russia invades Ukraine yeah, or whatever. Well, yeah. Or, or I was, you know, for the U.S. example, you know, like Japan, you know, <laughs> dropping bombs on us. And then the U.S. goes, okay, we declare one war on Japan. And everyone else in the world goes, hey, screw you, America. What the hell are you doing in Japan over there? We're going to all gang up and attack you. It's like the second you attack one person and destroy just one of their cities, just one, and then all of a sudden you now have to have a domination victory. You cannot beat the game in any other way because people will refuse to deal with you. They won't do any sort of trades. They, there's no diplomacy that you can employ. So then, oh, wow. then oh, I just feel like even well, if you were just being attacked and you were just yes. defending yourself. Well, because I defended myself by destroying their city. <laughs> but, I mean, see, that, that's that's the trick. The trick is that as soon as they sue for peace, you have to accept it. If you don't accept their peace offer, then everybody starts to see you as a war monster. So are you saying that when I had positioned all of my siege units ar- in, around their city, accepted their peace offer? so I can move them closer, <laughs> and then declared war and immediately destroyed their town in one fail swoop, in one turn. Well, the problem is that, that was you, a bad move? I would say that's more of a Lannister move. Oh, okay. Yeah. You see, the problem there, though, is your units, uh, if you declare war again after the, um, the ceasefire, your units all get pushed out to their border. Um, so you really can't even do that. Yeah, no, I, it's because I kind of did, because what I did was I took over part... Like, I used a um, general to mm. go in. Like, you know how the generals can form? Yeah, you can do no, the I Citadel. Don't. Okay. <laughs> you form a Citadel. So, basically, I kind of... You can take over people's territory with your general. Because they, they really they like abs- that. Yeah, they absorb <laughs> the territory around them. So, I, would, I was using Citadels to, like, basically kind of push their territory back so I could move my siege units in. So that I could just, in one turn... It was really cheap. But the reason I did... I'll tell you why I did it. Here's what happened, right? So, this is actually a great story. So, um, I think they were playing... Oh, what is it? I think... Oh, God. It wasn't Monaco. It was, like... One, one, it was one of the... Uh, Tropico? No, it was the one with the little, like... Almost like the like the, the Muslim moon-looking symbol. Um, I'm trying to remember. Yes. I'm pretty sure it doesn't know. It's like green and white. I forgot. Anyway, that civilization. 
and uh, the guy, I, maybe, I don't think it was Morocco, but something like that. And so the guy... I think that's just, like, the Arabs. It might just be the Arabs, yeah. I yeah. think it might be, like, Persia or something. So anyway, so he keeps sending his um, little priests to come over and convert convert all of my people to his religion, right? And I keep, And I keep talking to him and saying, stop doing this, cut it out. What are you doing? I'm trying all this, like, diplomacy. And the guy, he starts getting really snarky to me, you know? And he's like, I will do whatever I want. I'm like, oh, really? Oh, really? <laughs> so that's when I start sending over my guy. And I, I, you know, declare one on him specifically to kill his priests, which he didn't like. Jesus! <laughs> so, well, but they were converting my people, right? So this, this, this is wait, 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 question. Who what? were you playing as? I was playing as uh, Poland at this Poland, time. okay. Yeah. What? That makes no sense. <laughs> What do you mean? I was Civ is alternate history, man. I was I was going for I was going see I was as Poland they're really good at um because you get you get free social policies so I was going for okay. a culture victory I wasn't trying to do any sort of you know warfare so I send my people so I so I so I you know kill some of their priests and he gets mad at me oh yeah whatever then, okay okay but then he decides that it was a good idea for him to like declare war on me so I go okay and that's when I started like move because I. At this point, by the way, I had, like, a massive army that I was preparing as a just-in-case measure. Mm -hmm. So I just, mm -hmm. I have all these, like, siege units. And I had two extra generals I didn't know what to do with, so that's when I started using my generals to form citadels and take the, take over their property. Okay. And then, like, and then put my siege units inside the citadel so they would be more defensive and then start, you know, bombarding their city. Right. Uh, but, yeah, so it, um... Needless to say, he had only three cities, and they were very close to one another, so it didn't take me very long to, to wipe them off the map. Right, okay. But so, people didn't like that. So moral of the story is, um, he tried to spread his religion, and you bombed him. I asked him very nicely to stop, to be fair. I specifically, I, multiple times I said, just like, stop sending your priests in, because there's actually an option. Mm -hmm. if you can actually, you can talk to them about certain things, like, mm -hmm. don't do this, don't do that, whatever, and like, see what they do, and all this kind of stuff. And um, I would specifically say, stop doing it, stop doing it. And he got really snarky with me oh, how in his he. response. So I felt slighted personally. Really? Yeah. Okay. I so, took it very personally. I'm going to go ahead and assume that <laughs> this is your Steam game that you've logged a lot of hours into? Yes. Okay. What, what Steam game have you not played? Oh, um, it was one that you recommended that I, that I got recently. It was actually for on GOG. Uh, good old games. I got, oh right, yeah. I got uh, Jade Empire. Oh yeah, what I haven't played, and you mentioned it was really good, and I just haven't had the chance um, to play a lot of games actually lately. So that one's definitely on my the top of my list to play when I get a chance, but I haven't had a chance to. That yet. still blows my mind. I mean, I, I know we've talked about this at length, but it's like Jade Empire is one of those games that people still talk about. You know, like we still talk about Knights of the Old Republic. Yeah. And Jade Empire is just way better yeah. than KOTOR. <laughs> and I loved KOTOR. I'm a huge KOTOR fan, so I'm surprised. Plus, I'm a big KOTOR fan, and I, I, know, I love martial arts. I love, you know, martial art movies and, and the movements and everything and games about martial arts. So it's right up my alley. I just haven't gotten around to it. How about you, Chris? Games that I haven't played that are in my Steam library. Um, a whole bunch. Um, I think actually one of my bigger problems is games that I've played but have not finished. Um, so, like, Bioshock is a big one. Um, I've not finished Bioshock yet. Would you kindly finish Bioshock? <laughs> <laughs> Just because you said would you kindly, I'm going to use my free will and resist that. <laughs> and I'm not going to do it. Oh, man. <laughs> um, I've also uh, man played... Man a slave obeys. <laughs> yeah. uh, speaking of Civ, I've played a lot of uh, the new XCOM. Um, have you had to finish that campaign? Yeah, that's another one I haven't even booted. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think what else. I, I'm not looking at my library right now, but I'm sure I could come up with like a, oh, why have I not played that yet? You know, like yeah. on like 20 of them. I mean, so. I, never bit, I never beat Skyrim, and I think I put about 120 hours into it, at least. It was uh, definitely way over that, 100. That's my most logged game, but it's because my little brother, um, before he got a Steam account, just borrowed mine. Yeah. Um, so he plays, like, all the Skyrim. And <laughs> I've actually been considering going back to Skyrim, because, you know, I've been a huge Elder Scrolls fan ever since, you know, Daggerfall. And, um, or is it Daggerfall or Dagger Daggerdale? Daggerfall. Daggerfall. That's right. Daggerdale is the, um, uh, Forgotten Realms, right? That yeah. was, it was Daggerdale, Forgotten Realms? I think so. I don't know. I, you're thinking of Icewind I've, Dale. Icewind Dale, that's what I'm thinking of, yeah. Um. I don't know what Daggerdale is. Daggerdale is a D&D &D thing. Okay, There's okay. a D&D &D game. Uh, but I've, I've logged, like, 800 hours in Morrowind and, like, 500 or so in Oblivion. And wow. when Skyrim came out, like, 
from the 11 11 11 release date uh till like the middle of the next semester i logged like 300 hours it was ridiculous wow um but then you know the modding community just makes them completely different games and so i was considering actually not playing skyrim waiting a year and then modding it to hell and then playing it for the first time but I have no free will. So. <laughs> See, what gets me with Skyrim is it's kind of annoying. It's, they make these all these really cool mods for it, um, but you're still very limited in what you can do in the game. Right. Like I know uh, one of the mods I got, someone made a Conan the Barbarian um, character model. Really? And the, the the sword, the sword of the Atlantean sword that he has, this is based on the Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, the classic from like uh, the 80s. Right. Um, Either and I wanted to, <laughs> yeah, and I wanted to role play as Conan. I, you cannot role play as Conan in Skyrim. You cannot do it. Right. <laughs> you have to role play as like their characters. Like you can't be the Conan personality. And yeah. I felt I felt kind of disappointed about that. I felt kind of limited that I, in what seems like a very open RPG, an you know, open role playing experience, you don't actually have that much freedom when it comes to the role that you're playing in the in the game world. Yeah. Another topic for another time. <laughs> Let's see. I mean, if we want to talk about, you know, like Jim went on at length about how much time he sinks into Civ Five. I mean, I've played a lot of Dota 2. <laughs> I think actually the last time... So, I haven't played Dota 2 since the middle of last year, just because I got so crazy busy with everything. I, I barely even watched uh, The International while it was on um, Twitch. I, I'm going to have to go back and rewatch it. And still... I've logged 2,000 hours wow. in Dota 2. 2,000 hours? Mm-hmm. I've not even played Dota 2. And that's without playing it for the past year. I've logged 2,000 hours. Wow. I think the only game that I that I have logged that sort of time in would be World of Warcraft. I can't yeah. think of another that I've put. Well, I can't remember. Did we talk about like time played in previous World of Warcraft games in another podcast? We, you, you mentioned that. Did yeah, it? We, yeah. yeah, you mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, the one character in Burning Crusade had a year's worth of played time on it. And this is 24-hour day, seven-day yeah. weeks. But, I mean, a yeah. lot of that was, you know, botting and <laughs> jumping around in Orgrimmar AFK. But Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Dota 2, of all of the, like, games in my library that just, when I mouse over it and I see the time played, it's just like, oh, man. <laughs> What else could I have accomplished in that time? <laughs> what is my life? <laughs> how, how much better would you be at Hearthstone if you had spent that amount of time? <laughs> Actually, speaking of Hearthstone, um, Blizzard just posted a new like associate game designer position on mm-hmm. for their Hearthstone team. And one of the... like Essentially, the, the job skills that they listed were be really good at Hearthstone... And, and really like card games, you know? Like, you know how most game industry positions, they say, you have to have shipped titles and whatnot. Yeah. Didn't even mention it mm-hmm. in this job listing. And so I was like, man, if I wasn't, you know, planning to pursue a PhD, <laughs> I'd totally apply for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Hearthstone is one, I haven't played that since the um, the open beta, or actually a little bit of closed beta. Um I've been meaning to get around to playing it, but I have a feeling now that even though it's only been out for a couple of months now, that I would get in there and just be so like outclassed as to like just not even be fun. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. What game would you, since you don't sink all your hours into Hearthstone like some of us, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what game would you say that you've logged all of your time into? Uh, um, I went through... I, I sort of do binges, so I have like periods where I log a lot of time. I can't talk today. I log a lot of time in a single game, um, and then sort of move on to the next one. Um, I don't really have like the whole like two thousand hour Dota equivalent. It's a shame um, you, really, you should. <laughs> You're um, only two thousand hours behind. Yeah, uh, I've played a lot of Civ Five, um, and I've played like little bits in vanilla. I played some in the next expansion and the next expansion. Um, I've played a lot of um, Borderlands Two. I kind of had like a couple of months there where I just like binged the hell out of Borderlands 2 and it was awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Is is this where I admit that I've never played any Borderlands game and you guys yell at me? No, but I oh, mean, okay. I played Borderlands 1 up to like level 18 or so. Mm-hmm. And then Borderlands 2, I, I got to the end of the game. Spoiler alert, I killed Handsome Jack or whatever. Um, but I never actually like 
continued. I never got to the max level. I never fought the uh, the extra boss. What was his name? The there's a whole bunch now, actually. Um, well, I know there's the DLC packs. Yeah, yeah, we have a friend who works on them. But mm-hmm. I mean, the what's the the worm guy? That was the yeah. Big I'm bag. trying to remember oh, the name of it. Oh yeah, seriously, haven't played. Yeah. It. Yeah. It Whatever. Like, anyway, it's like so, mega something. Or so what is it? What yeah. is the deal with Handsome Jack? Is that is he really handsome, or is that sort of like an He's ironic so name? Handsome. Or <laughs> my, god. my god. Well, he he does wear a mask, so we actually don't know what it, he looks like underneath that. Oh, is that actually a mask? Yeah. Though? Okay, I always assumed it was because it okay. kind of looked like it, but with the Borderlands art style, I could never really so tell. He's yeah. supposed to be like so radiant that if he takes the mask off, it would yeah. just overwhelm you with there you beauty. Go. So. It, it's like looking at the face of God, you know, you just die instantly. He's that handsome. <laughs> okay. uh, oh, he's got that smolder. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of games that you've never played and it's kind of strange, mm. what about games that you have no idea? why they're even in your list. Oh, see, I got a great one for that, and we were talking about about it before. I was looking at my GOG library, um, and there was this game that I saw that called Teen Agent. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Just called Teen Agent. and it's apparently, like possible. Yes, and apparently it is a, um, a point-and-click adventure game, a mystery detective game from 1994, which was around, wow. yeah, around the time that I was actually really into those games, and I've never heard of it. So that means it must have been really popular. Um, <laughs> but... So I was I was looking at it. it took me a few minutes looking at this because I kept searching for it online and I couldn't find it. Then I realized it's not teen agent one word or two words. It's teen agent like teenager teen agent. That is just brilliant. Clever. Yeah, it's, it is. <laughs> I mean, it's genius. It is genius. <laughs> Why did this game not sell a billion copies? <laughs> You yeah. know, I just it's just one of those miss, missing gems, the diamond in the rough. Yes. There's like someone working on this game that will stumble upon this podcast and hear me talk about it and just seethe with anger. <laughs> <laughs> uh. That was my magnum opus. <laughs> I mean, I think most of my games that it's just like, what is this when I'm flipping through my Steam library are games like that, like the random puzzle games. Yeah. Because, you know, with, with uh, Humble Bundles and whatnot, you get all of these extra games that you just don't even care about. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Humble Bundle, it's like, you know, pay a penny and you can get all of this stuff, but pay three and a half dollars and you can get the game you want. Yeah. So it's like, I bought uh, XCOM for mm-hmm. like, I don't know, five bucks on uh, Humble Bundle. Yeah. And then I got a bunch of other li- little games that ended up being really awesome, like uh, Hotline Miami and whatnot. But I was flipping through and I've got like... Puzzle Agent 1 and Puzzle Agent 2, they made a sequel, and, like, I'm not gonna play either of these, and there's, like... You're holding out for Puzzle Agent 3. Yeah, I'm I'm honestly just teeth-gritted, wait, can't wait for the announcement (laughs) at E5. Do your decisions for Puzzle Agent 1 and 2 carry into 3? I mean, I would assume so, I mean, if it's that good. (laughs) But, uh, I mean, there's games, like... Fluffy Bunny Cave Explorer that come in some of these humble bundles that I just like. Is that a real game? I don't know if it's exactly uh-huh. called that, but it's like because that piqued my interest. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> there was a game where I don't even remember the title of it, but I was just down arrowing through my Steam library, and the game just had fluffy little chibi characters on it, and <laughs> it none of my friends had played this game. You know how it says like friends playing this game, whatever. yeah, and I had no idea what it was, and I. I hovered over the install button, but then thought against it. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Uh, was it a big install? No, no, I just, I mean, why would I want to play that game? <laughs> Fair enough. There's a lot of those in my library. Yeah. I also get a lot of things on Humble Bundle that I, I buy thinking I want to play them, um, and then I actually, like, try playing it a little bit and just kind of like, yeah, maybe not. Like, yeah. I, I got, like, all the original XCOMs, like, the old school DOS ones. Um, oh, I had no and, idea that it was like a an existing series. Yeah, it was. Oh, really? Um, and I've heard really good things about it, but it's one of those games that might have been like really awesome for its time, and even like when you hear about it, it's like, oh, those would be awesome features to have today. Why don't we have those? Yeah. But then it's just so unwieldy by modern standards that you can't really get into it, and that was kind of XCOM for me. Like, I couldn't even figure out how to start a mission. <laughs> see, I, see, I never played the XCOM series, actually. I heard they were somewhat similar to Fire Emblem, but in space. Is that not yeah, true? I mean, oh, the it, only it, thing it is, I know about them... Yeah is that like what everybody tells me about these games is you build up your characters and you have your teams and you send them off to do missions and whatnot and they can apparently die like permadeath yeah Yeah. and for some reason it's really emotionally like (laughs) gratifying like if your guy dies you're like oh fuck what have i done so it's kind of fire emblem like Yeah. yeah or maybe like fallout tactics would be a better comparison um i don't know about the original XCOMs. the um 
the newest XCOM reminded me most of my experience with um, uh, Final Fantasy Tactics. Final Fantasy Tactics. Um, have you played Fallout Tactics? Is- I've not played. I played a little bit of the PS One version. I have not finished it. I've gone like maybe five chapters in, something like that. What? What? Uh, Final Fall- Fantasy Tactics. Fallout Tactics. Oh, Fallout. No, I've not played I Fallout. Curious. So I was another Am one. Am I that missing something? <laughs> yeah, Final Fantasy Tactics was um, a good one. In fact, not that long ago, I played um, the PSP version of um, Tactics Ogre. Mm-hmm. Um, they they did like a, a slight remake of it, which was done by the same team that did Final Fantasy Tactics uh-huh. back in the day. Um, actually, it's it's has an even more involved narrative and, and involved characters than Final Fantasy Tactics. So I'd recommend it if you're looking. Wait, for really? That cool. Final Fantasy Tactics? Yeah. yeah. It's by the same team, but the thing is that they were not as um, limited. It was before they were working. They basically Square Enix liked that game so much that they bought the people that were working on not Square Enix. Square Soft bought the people. Literally, (laughs) no, no no joke. They actually literally hired the team that worked on it and put them in their in their own studio and said, "Here, work on a Final Fantasy version." Like chained um, them to the computers. (laughs) You can get up when we have a sequel. (laughs) And the um, the XCOM, it, it does. It, it reminds me of Final Fantasy Tactics, but it does play differently. Um, for instance, like all of your team, for the most part, goes, and then all the enemy goes. So it's like turn-based in that sense, not like you know the initiative that they have in Final Fantasy. Sure. Um, also, the emphasis is on ranged combat, so there's a lot more to do with um, line of sight, taking cover, that sort of thing. Whereas Tactics is more like just make sure your guys in the right spot and at the right elevation to use a spell that's going to do more damage or something. So, sure. Um, yeah. So I mean, there are differences obviously, but that's just kind of what it reminded me of: mm-hmm. grid, okay. grid-based, turn-based, tactical. Man, well, all the talk about Final Fantasy kind of want to makes me transition to our uh, topic of choice for the the meaty discussion. You know, and one of the things that Final Fantasy tends to have a lot of is you know, the whole silent protagonist or the, you know, the avatar player character, you know, one that comes to mind, obviously, is that Cloud for... It seems like everybody loves Final Fantasy VII. Honestly, it's one of my least favorites, but, you know... I wasn't really a big fan. I mean, I, I enjoyed Seven. I didn't play Seven when it first came out, and maybe that influenced it. Yeah. My experience of Final Fantasy Seven was on the PC. I had to play the PC version. Yeah. Um, maybe around 2000, so it was a few years after it came out. Um, maybe a little bit before, like ninety nine, but um, I I enjoyed the game, but I enjoyed other Final Fantasies. Oh yeah, certainly. I mean, Final Fantasy VII is still a great game, but I mean, nine is far and above the best, right? I mean, I, I haven't played enough nine to be able to really speak to it. So I I enjoyed nine quite a bit. It is one of my favorites. I would say I'd probably lean more towards six. Sure. I probably put the most hours though into the original because growing up that was one of the few RPGs it that I had. Over, yeah. yeah, and I played that one on the NES over and over. I played it with multiple teams. I would do challenges where I would try to beat it with um, just a bunch of white mages. Nice. I don't think I actually beat. I'm not sure if I actually won that challenge. To be honest, I might have lost interest part way through. I don't even know if that's possible, honestly. No, it is, but it's it's pretty tricky. Now I did do a an all black belt uh, challenge. The mm-hmm. little the, the I think they start as black belts and they level up to monks, if I remember correctly. I thought it was like martial artist and then it becomes a black belt. Or something Maybe like that. that could be right. I think monk was a totally different class. You could be tr- you could be right. I'm trying to remember. It's been a while since I played it. Yeah. The point is, in that game, you have like the, the class change, the class uh, yeah. as later on. Um, that challenge actually wasn't a challenge at all because they get so overpowered later yeah. on. But like, all right, so. The first Final Fantasy, especially, you know, the protagonists don't speak at all, right. you know. And you can name all of them whatever you want. Yeah, so this concept yes. of, like, the avatar and the, yes. what is an avatar, um, does an avatar have to be a game character, you and know? Now, now, are we talking about Aang from Avatar The Last Airbender? No, no, we're uh, talking about the one with the blue people. No, but I, I thought we were talking about the, the, the original story by M. Night Shyamalan, who wrote, <laughs> who wrote it himself with absolutely, based on absolutely no other property. And it was a masterpiece of <sighs> cinema. Wasn't it directed by the guy who did Titanic? What? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Stop, guys. <laughs> Sorry. Guys. <sighs> we're turning to the topic at hand. No. <laughs> on, no, on a, more, on a more serious note, no, we're talking about the, we're talking about the player's avatar in the game world. Yes, yeah, we're talking about that. Yeah. Physically ill. <laughs> Our jokes yeah. are just too bad. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, one of the things that we mentioned in, I think it was the first podcast, uh, where Jim and I and um, 
we kind of like went back and forth on is Link an avatar, you know, in Zelda, and mm -hmm. is Link a you know would it be the same if it was a male or female character, etc. Um, that's sort of also um, one of the points of discussion. You know, is like is you know what exactly is an avatar? What entails um, the putting your own character into your game character? Does it have to be a game character? Uh, specifically mentioning like Battlestar Galactica, you know. Um, or no, not Battlestar, sorry, um, Stargate, right? The character who had the, the shirt. The I am you. Yeah, shirt. I am you or whatever. You, like, you are here. Yeah, you are here. You I are here, so yeah. yeah. You know, um, so what exactly does it take for a character to classify as an avatar? So, um, yeah, I mean, I would say, to me, I think that the character the character has to reflect the way that you want to approach the game and you want to play the game. You have to be able to... Um, project your own experiences and your own personality onto the character, okay. I think. So if the character has too defined of a personality, has too defined um, character traits, has a very specific task in the, jo in, in the game itself in which um, it defines them as a person, mm -hmm. then to me they're not a, an avatar, they're a character in okay. and of themselves. So, I mean... Let's go to... So Final Fantasy, if, to get back to Final Fantasy, right? That sure. In, in the original Final Fantasy game, all four of the the um, Heroes of Light, the Warriors of Light... Warriors of Light, yeah. ...are all avatars. Mm -hmm. You define... You create them in your own way. Um, some of the some of the pixel images are not even clear on whether they're male or female. I mean, some lean one way or the other, but you could make an argument for many of them. You're not really sure. Sure, yeah. So uh, there's... You could... And I would sort of create my own kind of story. I'd give them names. I'd kind of pretend that they had little interactions but yeah. they really didn't they no. didn't they didn't talk to one another they didn't have any sort of um real personality if you wanted to give them any sort of a personality or character you had to do it yourself mm -hmm. well okay so then how about um one of the most often referenced game avatars uh is gordon freeman from the half-life series you know yes so what what exactly about Gordon Freeman's construction, or I, I guess the construction of Half Life, you know, since he really doesn't have much of a construction, what makes him the perfect avatar? I think one of the things that stands out to me right when you when you start playing the game, um, I think the first person perspective has a big part in that because people interact with you and talk to you in that game, and because of the first person um, experience, it feels more like they're talking to you. So it's a combination, I think it's a combination of that and that Gordon doesn't seem like he's talking back to them. It's just kind of, he's kind of listening. And just like that, you're sort of listening to what they're saying as well. Okay. That's, I mean, that's my initial impression whenever I play the Half-Life games. Well, um, Chris, do you have any sort of reference that you can think of where that isn't the case? I mean, I know that, you know... Uh, there are plenty of first-person avatars that that do kind of respond, but you know that's not necessarily that doesn't mean that they have a, such a defined personality that you can't project yourself onto them. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, we we to reference when we played recently, um, BJ from Wolfenstein. Um, he has a more defined personality in the cinematics where he's talking about um, like what's going on and yeah. giving his opinion on things. Definitely. But during the missions, it's pretty much just coming down to talking like this about what's going on. I'm going to do this thing now. You know, that sort of thing. Um, and in that way, it's sort of just like, you know, giving him like a voice in the game, reminding you that he's there, maybe giving the player hints about like sort of how you ought to be thinking about things or how to approach things um but for the most part i mean especially with given that the gameplay is fairly open-ended you can approach things stealthily go on guns blazing um i think that he's a decent example of an avatar who really maybe does have more of a defined personality really and that's kind of the question mm -hmm. i think we have to ask is does an avatar necessarily need to be so like blank that the, like the player can project whatever they want or can an avatar also have defined characteristics well so essentially are you saying that there's like a spectrum of avatarhood? I guess. I mean, I've never really thought about it that deeply. To like, you know, I, I think to the to, there's some games where it feels like it, it definitely feels like I am playing as this character. The game right. is like presenting itself in a way, and the characters like controls in such a way that I'm playing as this character, basically whether I like it or not. And then there's some games where you kind of understand the character, but you feel like you still are the character in a way. 
Um, so I think that there could be a spectrum. Um, yeah, I, I would say so. I think there almost could be considered three categories to it, and I think there's kind of an in-between level between a very well-established, a well-defined um, character that has... With, like, a, a developmental com a comp arc. Yeah, a developmental or complex personality that you would normally get inside a more na narrative-heavy game. And there's something that sort of falls in between of the, the complete avatar. Because in the in-between space where you kind of have they, have... they have personality traits and quirks, and you kind of understand what their character is all about, but at the same time... Um, there's not complexity there, so you're able to you're able to project a little bit, and you're able to with a little bit of imagination role play that you are that character. Example would be um, someone like Mario, where he has certain character traits that define him as Mario, and he even you know he has little like reactions to jumps and things, and he makes little noises, and uh, we all kind of have an idea of like what Mario is and who Mario is, and we all kind of have a similar idea. Um, but at the same time, he's not really what I would consider a complex character. He's not well, really so, a character in, in that sense. I think that Mario, his the context for him to be a character and the, uh, the actions that you're taking with him, I don't think that really allows him to be an avatar, does it? Like, I, I'm not saying he is. I'm saying he's kind of in between the avatar and the complex character. Like, if we're doing a spectrum... And you've got this, on okay. one hand, you've well, got the complex, narrative-heavy, goes through a, a character arc. Clearly, um, you have to sort of... Like, he has a very complex personality character, all that kind of stuff. And on the other side, you have the blank slate. I'm saying Mario is kind of somewhere in between. Well, it sounds like then we're also trying to sort of, um, based on kind of like reactions from you guys, <laughs> that we're, we are distinguishing an avatar from any playable character. Not all playable characters are avatars. Not all avatars necessarily are playable characters. Well, right. no, well, because I, I would say that you know there are avatars in non-playable media. Yeah, you know, I mean, we just talked about the. I can't remember. Is well, it is it Stargate or is it Battlestar? One of the two. I don't one know. of the two. It's not. It's not Battlestar. No, because I, was I it like SG One or something. Yeah, like that? I haven't seen Stargate I, and I have seen Battlestar, and that's oh, how well, I know that there I know you what go. I'm talking about. Anyway, there's this character in the show that's like he wins a contest to join the crew, and you know um, he's not really supposed to be there. He's not like personnel. He's not trained, and the whole time he wears this shirt that just on it is like "You are here," and it's this really heavy-handed message to the audience. It's like, this guy's you! You're in the show! Yeah. Get involved! But, but see, I think that's different. That's that's a self-insert, and that's and that, to me, is different from an avatar, because I think the avatar is meant to be you, that is you in the game world, and you have to be able to interact. So I think, I think when you're talking about media that is non-interactive, you can only ever have a self-insert. I don't think you can have an avatar. Because Even with passive interactivity? I, think, I mean, honestly, I think, I think that's an oxymoron. To be honest with you, I, I think, think that's that that phrase. I think is an oxymoron. I don't think you can have passive interactivity with media. Okay, I think it's either well, well, that's definitely a different word. What about passive agency? Sure. Okay, but if you don't think, uh, so you think that an avatar relies completely on interactivity? Yes. Okay. I think I think in order for in order for some in order for it to be an avatar of your of you in that game in that world. You have to be able to interact with that world in some way. And if you can't interact with that world at all, then it can't be an avatar. See, I just don't know if I agree with that, because I feel like while interactivity is definitely the most heavy-handed and bare-faced use of the avatar, I think that you interact with something at least on a sort of passive level when you watch a movie, when you see a play, when you, you know... Obviously... An avatar is much easier to use functionally when you get into like choose your own adventures and video games and things like that. But I can definitely relate to a character in such a way that I project myself into whatever media it is, whether it's a show or a book. You know, um, yeah, I don't think we just do that all the time as an audience. You know, we're constantly looking for things in stories that we relate to, and that's kind of our way. Right. Of so can you not? Can you not construct a character in, like, a TV show that is functionally an avatar? Well, I mean, I see what you're saying, but I think I think there's a difference between making a character relatable 
and even specifically making a character to be a sort of audience self-insert um, and an avatar in particular. I think the experiences that you're talking about in other media like um, television, movies, plays, books, when you, you put yourself in their shoes, this is sort of a... Um, it's an imaginary, an imaginary sort of like you're not actually well, right. There's, there's no, there's no real interaction. Right. There's the transference of you know yourself into that character in the sense that if I'm reading the Wheel of Time, you know Randall Thor certainly isn't my avatar because he has very, very noted character development and um, this existential plights that I don't share. You know. And uh, sometimes he's portrayed in such a way that you're not supposed to relate to him. But, you know, that's certainly a difference from, say, you construct a character that has no real, like, story arc development, and they are just there to be a sort of character that the audience can relate to at all times. So they feel that they have a place in whatever's going on on screen, right? And no, and I think that definitely goes on. I mean, I just you wouldn't use the same quite the same terminology, but I don't think it's important to get bogged down in terminology. Okay, so it's essentially but that just... it's it's similar. I think it's definitely a similar concept. I think that's um, certainly some, uh, something that is used, particularly when you have a lot of characters and you want them to feel like you want the audience to feel like they're a part of the group. I think um, a lot of anime does this, where they want you to feel like you're one of the members of the group, even if the other ones all have like very distinct personality traits. There's sure. normally one kind of tossed in that's like the best friend that doesn't have any sort of real personality <laughs> yeah. and you gotta feel like, well I'm his best friend too, kind of. <clears throat> so I, I kinda see where you're coming from with that. Okay. I, I think well, it's not quite the same thing because you're not interacting. Okay. Don't get me wrong. I can I can agree with that. So if we're just sticking with the strictest sense of Avatar, you know, let's look at you know where it started. You know obviously, you know, um you know, avatars have certainly had more prominence in games. You know, so I don't know how what exactly their point of origin was. Uh, yeah, so I've I've pulled some of that up uh, since we talked about that, and this is actually coming from um, a book by uh, Zach Wagner called "My Avatar Myself: Identi Identity in Video Role Playing Games," and uh, he has a section where he talks about the the term avatar. And uh, he says that it was first used in the virtual context, in other words, how we're talking about it right. here, in 1985, in the Ultima series, Ultima 4, actually. And your player character in that game was just called Avatar. In okay. Unless you change the name. This is when it was first kind of introduced, but it sort of quickly caught on. It was used in Habitat a few years later. I never played that, but Shadowrun in 1989 I did play. And it was used you know, pretty heavily in that one. Yeah. And Shadowrun was based on... Um, a tabletop game, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. <laughs> now, um, in Ultima, I can't remember, you couldn't rename your characters, could you? I never it, played Ultima. It, it was just Avatar. You could be right, because it's been so long since I played those. I that. don't remember. But, I can't either, honestly. You may be right. But that's an interesting thing to think about. You know, um, are, when, when you have opportunities to rename your character, how much does that add to the Avatar process. You I know, think it adds a lot to it. Right, for sure. I, really do. I, I think it does. But, you know, alright, this might be a good time to transfer into the Link argument, because mm -hmm. you can always rename Link. Yeah, but, but the nobody does. Uh, <laughs> wait, hold on a second. People do, like, for example, I would always, uh, a lot of times I would rename Link so that I would, I would be able to tell whose game save it was, but when I was playing, I was always Link. I never had any, I never had any, like, thoughts. I'm not really playing as Link. I'm playing as Jim. You know, if I was if I had made my own safe game name, um, so yeah, I think it's. I don't think I think the name is important. Assuming that the name that you're giving the character is the name that you are envisioning that character with, versus it's a name for the save file. And I definitely think that, especially in earlier games, the name was really more used as a save file than it was as the name of the character. And I know later in some of the Zelda games, the name would actually kind of pop up when you would talk to someone. Mm -hmm. Ever since then, I would always name him Link, though. See, I just don't know. I feel like you got to be a little biased on this. Because, I mean, if we're talking about, like, Final Fantasy 1, you yeah. know, and you can rename all of those characters, and we're saying those are clearly mm -hmm. avatars, mm -hmm. and 
ever since you've been able to do that. And in all sorts of games but from that time But in many of the Final period, Fantasy games, you're not playing as avatars at all. Like, for yeah. example, in Final Fantasy VI, there is no avatar. Yeah. And all when, of those uh, have very distinct personalities. Yeah, when you get to seven, I mean, like, you know, you can rename all of the characters in your party. Cloud you know, too. Not Cl- Cloud, Cloud can be Steve. You I know, would T- say Cloud Tifa, is not an avatar either. Tifa can also be Steve, and Garrett can also be Steve. You can they have all your characters be Steve. Being Steve. Yeah. But everybody refers to them as Cloud and Tifa and Garrett. You know, they... I think the same thing kind of goes for Link, too, because you sort of have Link be- basically being the same person, looking the same, playing the same role in each of them. Um, it's like, it's the legend of Zelda, Ganon, and Link. You know, it's never the legend of Zelda, Ganon, and your avatar. I think the game almost needs to have you be anonymous going into it if you're going to have that sort of, like, full, like, I'm projecting myself onto this avatar sort of, yeah, like, slate. Yeah, I agree, and I also think uh, that the name of it already kind of suggests that these are meant to be characters. It's the legend of Zelda. It's not the legend of insert name here. It's the legend of Zelda. So, but, but, but the hero sounds, in green isn't Zelda. Yeah, yeah, you're not playing right. Zelda. Of course, the hero of green though is Link, and everyone understands that going into it. I think a good example of this, where I think people forget um, the names, are when games don't even tell you what the official name of the character is, mm-hmm. and, and and or they do, but you have to seek it out, or sometimes the name is there, but it's almost hidden. Like, I know in, in Fire Emblem Awakening, um, I don't know if y'all have played the newest Fire Emblem. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, yeah, it's really good. It's a really good game. And uh, they recently announced um, two new characters in Smash Super Smash Bros. Yeah. from Fire Emblem. Yeah. One of which is Lucina, who has a you know very clear uh, character. Mm-hmm. The other, though, is, for me, was always just the Avatar. It's yeah. known as the Avatar in the game. And they said, introducing Robin, and to me, I said to myself, Wait, what? Robin, huh? I, I think Robin actually, though, was the default name. I know that. That you erased. But the, but the but thing yeah. is, it's not... Robin is clearly meant to be... It's meant... He, mm. he or she is meant to be your avatar. It is... That's the role that it was that it was always meant to be in the game. Yeah. Um, to go back to kind of what you were saying in, in the story, and it's got to set up like a self-insert inside a narrative uh, story where um, you're there to be a a part of this group of uh, warriors and and mages um, and thieves, etc. So um, you kind of are are a self-insert slash avatar kind of playing both both roles because it is a a narrative heavy game as well. Um, But yeah, I thought that was one of those times where um, I don't think anyone, I think I'm not the only person that had that reaction to seeing the name Robin and thinking, that's not that's not the right name, <laughs> but I would challenge you to think of to name or find one person that would see Link in a video game and go, "That's not Link. That's yeah. X." Sure. Yeah. Okay. You, that's. I mean, that's a fair argument, but I mean, that's also Fire Emblem's main character is not advertised wildly as being Robin, whereas Link is called Link by everybody, like even Nintendo themselves. Right. Because Link is a character. That's that was that's kind of my point. I'm not going to say that Link is the the very developed character at all. I think Link is kind of more like Mario, where he has certain defined traits. But like Gordon Freeman is always Gordon Freeman. True. Like I, that. Yeah. Just because the character has a name attached to them and they have a narrative mm-hmm. attached to them doesn't mean that they can't be an avatar. Yeah, and that's that's my argument like, too for there being like different levels because yeah. I think that you can have a character that's still predefined, and if we're sort of treating the avatar as the avatar is my way into this game space. Right. Then it's still an avatar. Like I would say that Link as a character is canon, but I certainly think he's an avatar because you have like you have all of these consistent elements of course. You have Zelda and Ganon and you have the danger or whatever. Mm-hmm. But with Link as an avatar, he's ever just the hero in green. Even in like the direct narrative that they present you in every Zelda game in the cutscenes in the the legends and the mythos it's always just the hero in green. But, or the hero what of time. Does, or the hero right. of time. But yeah. what does Link do in the game? Save Zelda. Right. But also, like, you can't go into towns and just kind of decide to, I don't know, like, burn down the village. You, I think there's a certain, straw man argument. I well, think. But I think you're, you're a particular... You, are a, you have very defined personality traits. I mean, you're not a complex character. You're a simple character. But Link has certain personality traits that I think define him as a character. He's heroic, he's courageous, he's adventurous. He, um, the way that he, for example, the way that he um, interacts with enemies, when, when an enemy comes up to approach Link, you fight the enemy, you kill the enemy. There is no, 
You do could I, run. Yeah, you well, maybe you could run, but <laughs> you know, generally speaking, that's not what you would do in, in a Legend of Zelda game. It's set up to you're there, you destroy the enemy. There is no I'm going to reason with the enemy. I'm going to Gordon react Freeman in can't reason with way. the Columbine soldiers. Yeah. Or Combine soldiers. Yeah, true. That's true. Gordon Freeman just shoots people. Yeah. I mean sometimes to your avatar again, like going on that scale, some games are more open, others, some are more closed. Um, your avatar, I think, is like on the most basic level defined as this is who you are in the game. Right. And if it's that simple, then it could be like... Well, but if it's that simple, then it has no definition because that's every game. Every protagonist is who you are in the game. Well, no. I would say there's a difference between who you are and who you're controlling. I think in... Okay. Well, like you mentioned that in Final Fantasy games, you have these like very strict characters because they exist within a very developed narrative, and I agree. While you can rename them, it's not you inserting your personality onto them. It's you are playing as Tidus. You but are see, but that's my argument. That's my same argument with Link. You're not inserting your personality on Link at all. Link has certain character traits, and you have to emulate those character traits when you play Link. So I think there's a distinct difference between inserting your personality onto something. That would be like a role-playing tabletop game. But that's what I think the Avatar is. I disagree. I think that's what it is. It's I think the Avatar is your way of interacting with the world. So if we're talking about Avatar in the sense of what I would say Link is an Avatar, you don't have, you know, your... You want to climb to the top of Hyrule Castle and just run around. Like, you know, if, if I was playing an open world, totally, like, the rules are very fast and loose... You know, I would be jumping on top of Orgrimmar Bank right now in World of Warcraft. I would do the same thing as Link. I just try and climb all over Castle Town. Yeah, but you and know, World of Warcraft—that's definitely one where you—that's an avatar, right? Sure, but just because you can't go beyond the rule set in Zelda doesn't make Link less of an avatar. Just because you have a defined mission, go slay the enemies that you encounter and do all of these things to either preserve the sages, rescue Zelda, you know, get the Master Sword, whatever, just because you're accomplishing these goals doesn't mean that you can't embody that character. You know, all the time when we're kids and we're playing with a toy, if we're playing with the Power Rangers, you know, the Power Rangers have characters. There's Billy and whatever, Jason, I don't know. But when you're playing with them, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, ah, bam, pow, crash. You know, that's all you're doing as the Power Ranger. With Link, all you're doing is bam, pow, crash to save Zelda. Well, I think there's I think there's more to it than that because there is this background mythology that kind of fills out the world of Legend of Zelda. And you're right that it's not usually thrust in the game. It's not like a, it's not thrust to the forefront a lot of the times, but it's there. And it's something that a lot of times... You'll see it occasionally. There's occasionally cutscenes and things like the cutscenes. Occasionally, there's moments where you have um, the story kind of comes into the forefront. A lot of it tends to be um, in the intros. Like I know, um, for example, in the Wind Waker intro, they have the whole kind of background of the mythology okay. of the character, and I think that's where you sort of see the character of Link. See, but I, I, I don't see how you can see the intro cinematic to Wind Waker and think character because they never once like give him a name in that intro. They never once describe his personality. Well, it's not the well, yeah, he's the hero. It's like look, if when I play when I when I play Legend of Zelda, I'm not playing as me. I'm playing as Link. When I hear the hero, yeah, that screams Avatar. Well, there's more. There's more than just the hero. I'm just saying that's one. No, of there isn't traits. though. In the I just replayed The Wind Waker two weeks ago, and that intro cinematic. It's like. Well, I'm not. I'm not talking about just the intro cinematic. I was using that as an example of the mythos of building the mythos of the character. The okay, but nowhere else in the entire playthrough do they do anything more that when referencing him than call him the hero in green. Oh wow, you're wearing this strange clothing from the island you grew up on. Like you're weird or oh you must be the hero in green mm -hmm. or the name that you entered in your save file. Mm -hmm. There is no established character for Link in in Well, I think you're getting too bogged down by the whole name issue. I don't think I am cuz you keep mentioning like they keep referring to you as the name on your save file, the hero in green, that well, sort of thing. Here, here's what they a, refer to you is not really what defines you as an avatar or not. Well, here's another thought for you though, because you mentioned you know World of Warcraft, 
<clears throat> and you said that you know you, the character that you play in World of Warcraft is your avatar, and that's like a really good example of like I think the the reason that, or the fact that it's customizable kind of like makes it seem more like it's you that sort of thing. Right. Um, but at the same time, that also has a very established mythology. Um, that builds up the world around you. You've got a very established mythology that defines what is the alliance, what is the horde, and when you choose a side, you're choosing a side based on that. Right, but, it, you but you're not a, a part of that mythology, though. Yes, you are actually. Kind of, but Blizzard not. has actually directly written in their lore to say, the group of adventurers slayed the Lich King, and then in the end notes it says, when we say the adventurers, we're talking about any World of Warcraft player that has defeated the right, Lich King but in that's, raid. Yeah, but that's not. But that's only if you were actually there and doing it and defeating the Lich King. Well, in a way, it's though, not the same thing. In a way, so, though, that's the sorry. That that, that same thing could be said of uh, the Wind Waker because the Wind Waker is referring to like you know the hero of time. That was you in the Legends of the Ocarina of Time. And if you weren't one of the adventurers that killed the Lich King, or if you weren't one of the Wind Waker. You just didn't play the game. Yeah, and you, you just hear about it posthumously. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that, you know, both of them in that sense are kind of the same. The only difference being that because you have more options to choose from in World of Warcraft, you know, the fact that you can choose to be a warrior or warlock or Well, yeah, a the customizability is important to the Avatar. That's what I'm saying. You're always... You can't customize Gordon Freeman. Yeah, you can change your approach to the game, though. You can kind of do that in Zelda too, in though. Terms I mean, of, in terms of your weapons, the the crowbar. You have a ton of different weapons in Zelda too. And yes, you, you but get, your weapons all have very specific uses. Your general well, so is, do Gordon Freeman, yeah. like gravity gun. It's, and it's yeah. pretty, yeah, but it's pretty different where you can kill someone with different sorts of guns that all kill the enemies in a similar way versus you have to use your like a sword to kill enemies, and then you have some other util utility weapons, like you can stun them with the boomerang. Can't you actually kill them with the hookshot, or does that just stun them? It depends on the game. It depends game. on the game. Yeah. And, um, the, and then you have like the bow and arrow mo and the, and the bow sling. And and most of them are utility, though. Like, you, don't kill you don't kill really anything with the sling. It's more of a um, stun. Okay, sure. But I mean, I think all of these are just really trying to nitpick to find ways that he's not an avatar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, my thought, and I'm going back to what I said already, I think my definition of avatar personally is um, more of an open thing. It's more about, like, this is who I'm controlling in the game, therefore it's my avatar. And then I'm, like, I'm, I'm open to having a whole bunch of different asterisks. Like, in this game, your avatar is more customizable. In this game, it's more defined, that sort of thing. But at the same time... Um, like, and I think a lot of it too just has to come down to the presentation in the game of how much they make it feel like it could be you, and yeah, how much they're telling think, you this. And, way and I are. agree, and I do think I definitely, I do agree that I'm biased on this issue. I'm not going <laughs> to deny that for sure. I'm not denying that. Fair enough. But I do, I do think presentation does because I think you touched on something. I do think that does factor into it quite a bit. And yeah, I think for sure. When when you're when you're presented with a game in which. Right off the bat, you're given a lot of customizability in terms of how you build your character. Mm -hmm. If you're choosing your your class, your race, your gender, um, what sort of clothing that you're wearing, your hairstyles, you know, all these kind of different different things about you, um, automatically you're encouraged to think of this as this is who I am in this world. Similar to a tabletop role playing game, when you have all these different options of what do I want to look like, what kind of role do I want to play in this party, what kind of weapons do I want to use, etc. Sure, sure. Versus you are uh, in this game, I'm going to play Link. In this game, even for something like, you know, or like a Final Fantasy example, I'm going to play Cloud, who's a silent protagonist. Mm -hmm. Or uh, or like Chrono and Chrono Trigger. Chrono. You know, these these guys are, I think, kind of like... I would, I would put them in a middle category. I wouldn't yeah. go so far as to say that they're um, and established characters, but I don't. I don't think they're quite avatars. I think there's. I, I'm kind of. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm arguing, with you. I'm arguing for middle categories. I'm with you that I'm I saying. think that Cloud is not an avatar. I think that he has very like projective qualities because he's a silent protagonist. Yeah. But he has direct narrative reasons to do the things that he's doing, like. He has, you know, his history with Sephiroth, he has the reactor at Nibelheim, you know, etc., etc. You talked about presentation. Let's go back to Wind Waker in, in that presentation. Link's sister gets kidnapped and you know, on the, the Dragon Roost Island, yes, whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then he saves her. And then what's his motivation? There's no like you know, Link, you have been raised to be this hero. Now go and do this thing. I think, but I think that's more an example of like a looser narrative from Nintendo because some some of the earlier uh, Legend of Zelda games were a bit more clear in that. 
Um, a lot of it came from the manual, admittedly, but they gave you a reason. Uh, I know in um, the Adventure of Link inside the inside the booklet, it talks about how um, because you had killed Ganon, the only way that Ganon could return to life is if you're captured and your blood is taken and it's used to revive him. So part of what you have to do to destroy Ganon forever is to go to each of these temples and insert the crystals to turn, you know, to, to destroy these temples. You can unlock the final, uh, what is it, Temple of Time, and go in there and finally defeat whatever. Okay, so Ganon... but now we're getting into non-diegetic elements. And no, it's actually in the game. Like if you wait at the at the beginning of um, the intro screen of the game and you pause for a bit and don't start the game, it actually scro text scrolls the story. But I just well, I, is that still? I, I don't. Know I think that's I non diegetic. Think, well, I, don't, I don't know if non diegetic is the right word because it it is diegetic. Yeah, it's it still, is in the game. It's still in the game world, and the elements are in there too. Like whenever you die, it'll it'll specifically say Return of Ganon. It's referenced in the game. Like specific diegetic, non diegetic, and when like... you talk to people in the towns in Adventure of Link, they reference it as well. Now, it's not. Don't get me wrong. It's I'm not arguing. It's definitely not as big on the forefront as Final Fantasy. It's sure. well, the later Final Fantasies. Um, it's closer to it's closer to the Final Fantasy One presentation. Sure. I think there is a bit more of a um, an attempt to make to make more established characters than something like Final Fantasy One. But um, but yeah, it's it's. Okay, but so you know, let's um, let's say that when you have that situation, and you have without Link, Ganon will be resurrected. You know, if Link dies, Ganon will successfully be resurrected, yeah. etc. You know, how is that any different from the narrative framing of Half Life Two? Um, it's been quite a while since I played it. Okay, well, but... so it's Gordon Freeman is a resistance fighter, right? right. And without that Gordon Freeman remember, right. rising up to stop them, the Combine <laughs> successfully takes over, and they have the dominion over this city, and they rule with an iron I, fist, honest, etc. I honestly think a lot of it is presentation, kind of what Chris was saying. I really do think that because of the first-person view and because of the way that people talk to you, it encourages you to think. Especially, I always got that sense when I would play would I would play both Half Life games, especially too that when they're looking at you, like at Gordon Freeman, because of the first person view, it makes yeah. it seem like they're looking at you. And maybe it's just, maybe I'm just too affected by the perspective, but that's a big difference. Well, no, me. I wouldn't say that it's that you're too affected. I think that first person presentation is extremely effective at communicating not only um, avatarhood, but also agency mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, it, because you it, have it's a, immersive. Yeah, it's because you have a more close look at what you're doing. Yeah. You know, um... Can we think of some examples of first-person games that are... in which you're not playing an avatar? I mean, very Like, like clearly. very strictly you are not playing an avatar? Or at least we could agree to one? I'm, I'm, I'm curious, because I, I have one example, but I don't know if you guys have... Call of Duty are all avatars. Definitely. Um, you know, uh... BJ, I would say, has a lot of avatar. So I would say that Wolfenstein is a really interesting example where in the cutscenes, he's not an avatar. Sure. In yes. game, he's absolutely yeah. an avatar. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the New Order. Right. For an Specifically the New Order. Because there's multiple yeah. design games. Um, um, another one of those I was going to mention was um, Shadow Warrior, uh, particularly the new one, uh, Lo yeah. Wang, the mm -hmm. character that you play. Mm -hmm. um, there are also uh, cutscenes in that game, and also the way that he reacts to things. He's constantly making comments, kind of the Duke Nukem. It's it's sure. different but similar if you've played Duke Nukem to um, how du uh, Duke Nukem is actually a decent example of. Yeah. You're not really an avatar when you're playing Duke Nukem. No, I was just about you to say you are Duke yeah. Nukem. Duke Nukem might be a good example of yeah, that. Yeah, and Lo Wang, if you've played Shadow Warrior, is very similar, where he's constantly making these like little jokes. What about um, for a game that more more people might have played? How about Dishonored uh, with Corvo? Yeah. 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 Do you think Corvo is an avatar? I think he's more of one than Duke Nukem. Or sure. Lane. Yeah. I think. Absolutely. I think. I mean, I do think Chris is kind of right that there is a spectrum there, mm. and I do think. I think it also has to come down to: Are we talking about technical definitions, or are we talking about kind of like narrative definitions? Well, I feel you know. <laughs> so as sort of a. a Tan a tangent to this. I recently was submitting a paper to a conference and I had some people look over my abstract mm -hmm. and we had this five minute debate over whether or not I was using a semicolon properly. <laughs> and then we finally got to this point where it was like, who the fuck cares? Yeah. <laughs> is it is it clearly readable? Do you understand it? Mm -hmm. You know, there's gotta be a point where it's like, okay, 
Word is no longer showing the green grammar underlined. <laughs> I think we're okay here. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you have this line with terminology that's very similar with agency. In gaming academia, people will get in sword fights over <laughs> what version of agency. Why well, are you talking about this definition or this definition or or this person's new definition? Yeah. You know? Who cares? Yeah, academia. You know, so <laughs> with the avatar, I'm very willing to accept a sort of gradient. Sure. You know? Sure. I'm I'm trying to think of a good word for this, and I'm I'm having trouble. I'm I, I think it might have been named before, mm -hmm. but that name for that kind of middling category where they have certain traits. Like another example, aside from like say Mario, um, would be like Donkey Kong. These sort of like they have. You're not really an avatar, but you're also not really a character. Like, there's kind of this middling where they have certain traits, they have certain personality quirks that kind of put them in the middle. And I don't mm -hmm. know if we have a good term for that. A caricature? I don't yeah. know. I mean, that's what, when you were originally talking about Mario, that's the word that I was thinking yeah, in my head, is that's that actually... Mario, Mario isn't a character mm -hmm. because he has no character development. Mm -hmm. Mario is a caricature. Yeah. That's actually a good... I like that, actually. Okay. I like that. Because Screw the interwebs. So, we got this. <laughs> I like that, actually. So are we going to say that in order to be a character, you need to have uh, character development? I think so. I think you have to have, like, defined narrative ju like justification uh, for your actions. Like, with Mario, there's no reason that, you know, he doesn't have a bunch of these power-ups in his pockets when he starts the adventure. And there's no reason that he doesn't have a wrench and he can beat people with it. Like, if he wants to hit a Goomba with a wrench, go ahead. He's a plumber. You know? <laughs> um, or in the cutscene to Super Mario 3D World, he and Luigi randomly pull out hammers and magically fix a pipe that takes them to this magical fairyland. You know? And it's like, all of these things are just caricatures of magical plumbers in the Mushroom Kingdom, you know? Mm. But they're still going to jump on enemies to beat them, they're still going to save the princess, and they're going to do so by walking forward. Um, and jumping over things. And jumping over things, yeah. So... Yeah, I can. I, I agree with you on that. I think, yeah, and I think... I know, think a lot of, there's a lot of Nintendo characters that are like that. Yeah. I think the thing that I'm, I'm willing to settle on is that there's Avatar caricature and character as that sort of spectrum and I would consent to Link falling between Avatar and caricature I was going to go the other way really? <laughs> but that's okay we can just I was going to go with he's a little closer to caricature, character than caricature I just don't know if That's we're ever going right. to find a resolution of this we debate. Well, where, where do well, you think we, Samus we can't, falls? We can, um, Samus? I've been wanting to mention Metroid for a while, because I actually think Samus is a lot closer to Avatar. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, you see, that's when you start getting into that weird thing again. Because, unless, unless we're talking about Other M, which never happened. Well, well let's see the thing, too, though, is that I think that Samus actually has a better defined story, like even outside of Other M, than, say, Link does. Well, it depends on what I instance know. of Metroid we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, because my experience with Metroid, I'm... Because and Fu Fusion, she has dialogue, even. Ah, in Fusion. In Fusion? A GBA. Fusion. I remember... I played that one. Yeah. Oh, okay. ah, Fusion. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of the original. I'm thinking of Metroid 2. I'm mm. thinking of Super Metroid. I'm looking at the... The OGs, and it's the same thing. The OGs. The OGs. <laughs> As, I'm sorry, but that's that's where I am. That's where I'm at. And that's, honestly, that's kind of what I'm think, looking at with... Mm. Um, with, I think with, for with the Zelda's portrayal too. of Samus... Metroid Prime too. I think Metroid Prime as well. It feel yeah. you're, you're really so warm the only it. Metroids that I have played are the original and Prime, and in those instances, both I good choices. I would say that Samus is pretty Avatar ish. Yeah. <laughs> there's but there's still some character character traits. So I think that she's. I don't think she's all the way over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she's straddling the line between, between caricature and. Character, but I do think that she's Avatar. closer to Avatar than say Link. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if we're going on a spectrum, you know, we're going to have like. Mario is going to be like he's almost. If you're looking at like like what is a caricature, I think you're looking at something like a Mario or like a Donkey. Okay, Kong. you know what? With that little like sort of final discussion, I think that yeah, I'm okay with agreeing that Link is a caricature. I don't think I think that that's as far as as close to character as he gets for me though. I don't think <laughs> I think if we've got three points along the line, I think he's on character, but I but would, would be say, inclined but would to you put say him he's, more towards... Would you say he's farther farther towards character than Mario, though? Farther towards character than Mario? Because I would say so. That's that's where I that's where I think I'm at. I don't think so. Oh, I, really? think, I think he and Mario are the same. 
and it really they can't both occupy the same well, point. Well, actually, a lot of it does depend <laughs> on which game we're talking about. Yeah, that's because also because true. Mario has been better defined in certain games. Yeah, but I mean, these are like fringe cases that sure. honestly a lot of people consider to be betrayals of the character. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, like we don't consider Link's animated. Uh, stint to be well, an accurate. Excuse me, Richard. Ah, <laughs> oh, you stole it. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, no, I mean, I, I, I see you guys are coming from, and I, I, do, I do like that character caricature avatar thing. But my thing, though, is like, I, I almost want to find another word for avatar because I see the entire spectrum as these are all avatars. Um, and like the pure avatar, whatever it is at the end, I think yeah. almost needs a different word. I mean, that's just me, though, because I, I, I sort of like want to adopt the technical sort of broad-based term, like, an avatar is the person I'm controlling in the game. So, like, uh, I don't want to say persona. Well, I think, I think what it, how it is now, it's just, it's functionally accurate. Because, sure. And the definition of avatar is intended to just be, like, the vehicle for your will in a game. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think that's, and, I think that's accurate. And character is something that has a character arc and a character development. Mm -hmm. And caricature are narrative elements that create a character that, you know, exists in the game space. You know, so it's like mm -hmm. with Mario, you have fat plumber, mustache, mushroom kingdom, jumps, etc. <laughs> I'd, I'd probably go with pleasingly plump, but yeah. <laughs> you know, Link, you have green sword toolkit of utility weapons, Zelda Ganon. And not, not so pleasant. Very blunt. Courage, yeah, Triforce. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think the thing the thing that stands out for me, even in, in Zelda, is that you have these kind of personifications of concepts in the characters. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of push, and that's kind of why, I, I, you know, I agree with you, they're, they're in the caricature space somewhere along that, in that chunk. Okay. And, you know, I know that um, Link, for example, you know, he's the personification of courage, is what he's meant to be. Right. And Ganon's supposed to be the personification of power. Ganon. You, Ganon. No, Ganon, sorry. <laughs> Ganon is supposed to be the personification of power, and you've got um, Zelda as the personification of wisdom. So you have this this whole concept of threes and the Triforce and all kinds sure. of things. In. So it is, it is meant to be more mythic and simple and more of a, a simple, straightforward yeah. storyline. So By the way... Why is he only called Ganondorf in Ocarina of Time? Because there's two different forms. Like, he's yeah. actually called Ganon when he transforms. It's before he was, I believe, fully corrupted by the Triforce of Power. Yeah. When he was still, um... But doesn't he have a human a form? In, I mean, he has a human form in Wind Waker. Yeah, and he's called Ganondorf there. Yeah. Uh, really? Did yeah. I miss that? Yeah, he is. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, well. <laughs> I think I need to go play Wind Waker for the fourth time. There you go. Nothing wrong with that. I guess it's just I'm so used to just seeing Ganon whatever, you mm -hmm. know, it's like Ganon in the middle of a block of text that it just didn't even register to me. See, I miss, yeah. I miss Ganon. I'd like to see Ganon, not Ganondorf. In, like the in bull Smash Ganon. Bros. Yeah. yeah. Like the bull Ganon with the big tridents. Mm -hmm. Or maybe like having a shadow form. Yeah, that'd be cool. Something like that. I, kind of I hope cool. we do get a Link Between Worlds moment in... Uh, the new SSB, you know, with like the the wall paintings and all that. I hope that's a stage in SSB. That'd be interesting. It yeah. could be on the 3DS version. You never know. So. Yeah, maybe. Oh, all yeah. right. Well, I think this has been a pretty engaging topic. I think we've actually gotten a lot of personal revelations yeah. out of this one. <laughs> <laughs> I learned something today. Yeah. But uh, I think that's we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. And yeah. thanks for joining us with Backward Compatible's third podcast. I think these are getting a little smoother, don't you guys? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think we're getting a little better. Cool. Well, uh, all right. I guess that'll be it for us. Uh, I'm Richard. I'm Jim. And I'm Chris. And thanks for joining us. Hasta luego, amigos. Backward Compatible wants you to join the discussion. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment on our site, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, let us know which game you think has the best avatar. Tell us about the time you really felt like a part of the game world. And hey, if you have anything else to say, lay it on us. We're all ears. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.